We'll have a wonderful evening and we've had a, a number of announcements to make. We've got lots of things happening. So I'm going to begin. And again, I'm Nancy Howell and I am one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And first thing I did, welcome everybody. Yay. Again, thank you so much for joining uh, us this evening. Now we have some volunteer needs. I'm going to be going over those. Our spring bird walk series will be starting in April. And I want to go over that as well. Of course, we always like to have people become members or consider becoming a member of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And if you want to be kept informed, rather than just getting our a uh, quarterly newsletter, we have our e-newsletter, which comes out once a week, and we'll talk about that as well. So one of the needs that we have is to be a judge at the Northeast Ohio Science and Engineering Fair, N-E-O-S-E-F, you'll see that listed there. Um, we are would like to have two judges, uh, and this would be judging students uh, uh, projects, students from seventh through 12th grades. Uh, the Northeast Ohio Science and Engineering Fair takes place uh, at Cleveland State University on Tuesday, March 14th. And what the judges will need to do, and there's a lot more, but I just want to go over a few bullet points as to what judges need to do. Um, they'll, you'll be available to preview uh, the uh, projects uh, on that day from 1 to 2.45. The judges will meet with, and, uh, and then we'll have some uh, instruction and then everybody will do a clap in. So while the students are coming in to be with their projects, all of the, the judges will be uh, applauding for the students. Um, you will have the opportunity to talk with the students and their projects from three to five. And then what Western Cuyahoga does is we have two special awards, uh, which has a certificate and monetary prize and we like to uh, select two if there are two. Uh, and then we usually have two projects that we give an honorable mention, which is a certificate to those students. We really highly suggest selecting projects that are Northeast Ohio based and deal with birds, wildlife, habitats, water qualities, environment, something of that sort, something that fits our mission. So uh, if you are interested, please contact me. If you would like to learn a little bit more about the Northeast Ohio Science and Engineering Fair, the website is very easy, uh, www.neosef.org. Um, and I do need to get information into the folks at uh, the Science and Engineering Fair by February, um let's see 18. so i need to let them know that we uh, will be participating uh by that time so we don't have very much time to uh hopefully get some judges but i hope we can so i mentioned our science and engineering fair but uh later in the year uh on saturday april 29th Parma Heights is having an Earth Day event on uh, Saturday, the April 29th, and we need some folks to help staff our table. It'll have educational items. It will have some things that we can, uh, like a little game, perhaps a craft. Uh, and this will take place uh, at the, uh, in, uh, again, Parma Heights at the Greenbrier Commons from one to four in the afternoon. Again, if you'd like more information, please contact me. Very easy info at wcaudubon.org. So it should be fun. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, the Spring Bird Walk series, we have uh, the, the series will begin on Sundays, uh, April 16th, and run through May 21st. 
there will be a lot of places, uh, whether it's Cuyahoga County, Lake County, Geauga County, or Lorain County, there are a number of organizations that are involved. Audubon chapters, park districts, museums, Holden Arboretum. Uh, I mean, there is just a lot. So there'll be an entire list eventually out uh, on our website. The ones that we have leaders for are Lake Isaac, which is the southern terminus of the Lake to Lake Trail in the Big Creek Reservation. Of course, the Rocky River Nature Center in the Rocky River Reservation, Station Road Trailhead in the Brecksville Reservation, and Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Uh, the walks start at 7.30 in the morning, and again, they're on Sundays, uh, April 16th, all the way through May 21st. Uh, there are a couple of organizations that have Saturday walks, or maybe their walks on Sundays are a slightly different time. So, but most of the walks, again, are at 7.30 on those dates. We hope you can join us. Look at that beautiful Baltimore Oriole. And of course, we'd like you to keep informed. As I mentioned, we have an e-newsletter. Uh, you may sign up uh, through our website, or if you can really quickly jot down the uh, uh, link here. Um, and you know, if you think you're getting too much information, you can unsubscribe at any time. So what this, what the e-newsletter does is just keep you informed of things that are happening Sometimes things come up real quickly, and uh, we like to remind people of events that are going on as well. So we like you to keep be kept informed. Thank you. And now Michelle Brocious, again, another one of our board members and our field trip co-coordinator. Michelle. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, everyone. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to cover our upcoming bird walks. I'm gonna announce a special event and invite you all to connect with us on social media. Next slide, please. Oops. All right, so please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walk. The next one is this Saturday, February 11th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and take a few hours to walk the nature center trails. Bill Dininger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk. Last year in February was really icy, and after a couple of attempts to safely walk the trails, the group ended up inside the nature center watching the feeders. Even so, last year we were treated to views of a pileated woodpecker as well as several morning doves. So let's just hope for better trail conditions this year. Next slide, please. All right, this past second Saturday was held on January 14th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, we started the second Saturday bird walk with the temperature at 27 degrees and ended with the temperature at 28 degrees. It was mostly cloudy with a slight breeze. 16 observers attended and we tallied 24 species. Many of the regular birds were present. We had a nice flock of 14 American tree sparrows flying and then diving into shrubs. Four Carolina wrens were heard. Our resident barred owl was perched in its regular location. Highlight was a group of four bluebirds foraging in a berry patch. Next slide, please. There we go. All right, please join us the fourth Saturday of every month for our Tremont Towpath Urban Bird Walk. The next one is on February 25th at 9 a.m meeting at the Towpath public parking lot on Abbey Avenue, just west of West 13th Street and east of the I-90 Interbelt Bridge. Nancy Howell and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk and they will guide you north through the Scranton Flats area of the Towpath. Last month, the group was treated to good looks at an American Kestrel. Other notable species from that walk include ruddy duck, American coot, double-crested cormorant, belt kingfisher, Cooper's hawk, bald eagle, and red-tailed hawk. It seems there's lots of bird activity in Tremont, so please join us this month. Next slide, please. All right, for our special event, David Lindo is coming back, so please mark your calendar for May 6th. 
The day will consist of a morning joint bird walk with Western Reserve Land Conservancy at Brighton Park. Space will be limited. We will have an opportunity to do lunch with David at a local restaurant that is limited res registration only as well. An afternoon bird walk at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve that is open to all. And then a group dinner with David that is also limited registration only. After spending the day with us, he will travel west where he will be a keynote speaker and lead a bird walk at the biggest week in American Birding Festival. So that's super exciting and it will be so great to see our friend again. So like I said, please mark your calendar for May 6th and be watching um, for those registration links coming in the next few weeks. Next slide, please. All right, finally, uh, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe. All right, I think that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, Michelle. And folks, I hope you noticed the lovely photos that Michelle has uh, on her slides with the exception of the David Lindo slide, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Michelle is a wonderful photographer. Look how beautiful. Thank you. Alrighty, I know Drina Nemes is, is joining us this evening and she is she coordinates our book discussion series. So Drina, are you there? Let me get unmuted. Hello, there good evening, go. I'm here. Uh, and welcome to uh, a a few words about our book discussion club. Uh, this year, our season, we've been talking about climate change, adaptation, migration, and we talked a, quite a bit about the pigeon. Next slide, please. Come on, slide, move. There we go. So we've already um, read Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid and A Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching. And I continue to recommend these books. They're delightful. And for April 25th, uh, our next selection will be A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds by Scott Widensall. And uh, that has been a New York Times bestseller. Uh, next slide, please. I was happy to see just today that uh, uh, the audio version of A World on the Wing is available at the Cleveland Public Library system. Um, and you can also find the uh, regular book, uh, hard, the hard copy book or an ebook at the Cuyahoga Public Library as well as the Cleveland Public Library. Adrina, Next this slide. is Nancy. May, may I ask a question? I noticed on the previous slide, it mentions that the uh, April 25th is at eight in the evening. Is it eight oh, or seven? It is seven. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep, just, yep, wanted, yep. just wanted to clarify that. Sure. Thank you. Next slide, please. Well, coming up, um, for February, the fourth Thursday, the Environment of the Americas Book Club is featuring a book called Slow Birding, The Art and Science of Enjoying the Birds in Your Own Backyard by Joan Strassman. And these are delightful uh, book discussions. The author is there and uh, they're very uh, nice introductions to the books. And then if you've read the book, they can be more meaningful. So that's the fourth Thursday, February 23rd at migratorybirdday.org slash bird dash book dash club. Next slide, please. And then uh, in March, they're featuring, along with our theme of migration, uh, flight paths. And uh, this is by Rebecca Heisman. And the subtitle is How a Passionate and quirky group of pioneering scientists solve the mystery of bird migration. So that's quite fitting. Um, next slide, please. Michelle had mentioned David Lindo. I'm so excited he's gonna be here again, wonderful. And he has a, a fantastic series webinars with uh, authors 
And so he has a regular series. Um, they're often on Monday and Thursdays. There are three coming up in February, the 9th, 16th, and 22, 22nd. And then also he has had an interview with Scott Widensall, although David says Scott Widensall, so I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing Scott's name correctly, but he interviewed him on April 27th, 20, uh, 2021. And uh, that is a, a real good interview and overview of the book that we'll be talking about. And uh, if you're interested, Scott Widensall, Widensall will be at the Black River Audubon Society. Um, uh, they have a, a special speaker series, and that's March 25th uh, at 3 p.m. at the Carlisle Reservation in the Lorraine County Park Systems. And you can um, get tickets uh, on the Lorraine Metro Park website. And that is all, thank you very much. And I just wanna say, Michelle, the picture of the dragonfly was fantastic, plus it looked like it had a little smile, something about thank you. his face. <laughs> yeah. All the animals smile when Michelle's taking a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thank you so much, Drina. Yeah, it's great fun to join in the book discussions. The Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching was great fun. That was just, uh, what, about a week ago? Yeah. And uh, fun book. Again, the, everything is just great. Thank you so much, Drina. And, and can now, I just mention, I'm oh, sorry, absolutely. really quick, That's right. that um, the book club discussion was recorded. That's another of our virtual programs. So if you're interested in in finding out what, um, what the Pigeon Watching book was all about, head over to our YouTube channel. It's, it's there and, and waiting for you. Thanks, Michelle. And Marianne Romito, another one of our board members and the Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio. Marianne. Well, hi there, everybody. Thank you for, for, for coming to our meeting tonight. Um, Audubon's Climate Watch is Audubon's newest program. Um, you, can, you can switch to the next uh, slide there. Um, the, Audubon is, is trying to decide, is trying to monitor how climate change is impacting birds. And the Climate Watch program takes place between January 15th and February 15th. So we still have a little more than a week to go before the monitoring is actually closed. Next, next, next slide. So if um, you want to find out more about it you can you can see my the, the 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 my presentation here at this link that's on the screen right now um and if you are interested in volunteering to uh monitor for birds we only we're only monitoring basically for five birds but two of them are our target birds are the american goldfinch and the white-breasted nuthatch so anybody in this group is, is quite capable of, of, of monitoring for those kinds of birds. So give, give them, watch that video. And if you are interested in doing, in doing so, give me a call and um, I'll be happy to set you up with a square. Next, next slide. That's it, we're done. Now, I know uh, the slides are showing the winter um, dates for the climate watch, but is there not a summer or spring climate watch it, time? There is Nancy. There's a the, we will have a, um, a summertime climate watch from May the fifteenth through June the fifteenth. So if you are if you if you missed an opportunity to go out this winter, you you can still do it this next coming summer. We'll be and we'll, I'm sure we'll have a lot more information as we get closer to those dates. Yes. Thanks again, Marianne. All right, I know our coffee coordinator, Amanda, I don't believe she's here this evening. However, uh, we do sell birds and beans coffee uh, on our website. It is bird friendly, with, uh, it's fair trade, it's organic, it's shade grown. The reason it's bird friendly is that the birds that are neotropical migrants that head to Central and South America, they spend their time in tropical rainforests. Uh, a lot of coffee is grown uh, in the tropics, 
but they removed the trees, the vegetation, the native vegetation. But with the, the types of coffee that these uh, farmers grow, the birds and beans, uh, Smithsonian's bird friendly, um, the, the forest is intact, the canopy is there. So a lot of the birds, again, heading down to Central and South America have a, 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 a almost natural uh, habitat that they can spend the winters. And remember, they spend a lot more time down in Central and South America than they do here up in, in the breeding area. So um, if you're running out of coffee, the next order is going to be going in on April 10th. There's a wide variety of coffees, uh, decaf, um, there's different brines, there's whole beans. So please take a look at our uh, the homepage, our website, and uh, see if there's something that you enjoy. Thanks. All righty. Uh, for next month, uh, Judy Semrock, who is a naturalist and educator and photographer, will be joining us. Uh, her program will be The Many Faces of Conservation. And if you haven't heard uh, Judy speak, um, she is just down to earth. She just knows the little intricacies, little things to look for. So we hope that you can join us on Tuesday, March 7th, right here on the Zoom station. Uh, again, our members meeting will begin at 7.30 with announcements and the speaker will begin around eight o'clock. But this evening, we have the, the luxury of having Natasha Bartolotta, who is the Communications and Outreach Coordinator from the National Loon Center. And her presentation will not just talk about loons, but the stewardship of the lakes and the National Loon Center that is, is in the process of uh, either being constructed or in the process of um, getting the, the blueprints ready. So Natasha migrated from northeast from the northeast to the Midwest in the fall of 2021 to join the National Loon Center. Prior, whoops, hey, prior to joining the National Loon Center, she worked for Audubon, Louisiana, as a coastal bird technician promoting community stewardship of beach nesting birds. Natasha also worked as a conservation educator for the Lehigh Valley Zoo in Pennsylvania and as a research assistant for projects on wild chimpanzees and orangutan behavior, uh, behavioral ecology in Uganda and Sumatra, respectively. Natasha has her Bachelor of Science in Biology from Cornell University, graduating with distinction in research. So please, this evening, let's welcome Natasha Bartolotta from the National Loon Center. I'm going to stop sharing. And Natasha, welcome this evening. Hi, thank you for having me, everyone. I'll share my screen and get my presentation going. Make sure. Wonderful. Okay, so yes, I do. Thank you for having me this evening. It's always great to talk to new folks. So I'm here to talk to you. As, as Nancy wonderfully put, the, the Loon Center, what about the loons, what we're doing to steward them, and about the future of our organization itself. It's so you saw a bit of my background there, and so I did have quite a journey to make my way to Minnesota, to the National Loon Center. I am from the Northeast originally, so I grew up in New York and Connecticut. Um, I remember bike riding along the Erie Canal there, so maybe slightly connection to maybe to you folks and I did find myself back in October end of October of 2021 driving all the way across Pennsylvania all the way across Ohio on my way to Minnesota to start my uh, job there at the National Loon Center and so I have a background in biology uh, with field work I originally wanted to be a primatologist had a bit of change of a heart and ended up in the bird world uh, before that I was a conservation educator at a zoo for a short time at the Lehigh Valley Zoo in uh, you know, in the Lehigh Valley area in Pennsylvania. And then right before coming to Minnesota, I was at Audubon, Louisiana, on the beach, best, uh, 
Beach Nesting Birds program. And so came to polar opposites there going from Louisiana up to, to Minnesota. But it's been quite the journey. I'm happy with where I'm at now. And my, my position now at the Loon Center allows me to combine my scientific and uh, education background together into this role. And so I'm the communications and outreach coordinator, but I do a lot of things role um, a lot of things related to our stewardship program a lot to our um to our outreach you know i've i can assist with our research programs with our with our stewardship programs our conservation programs um all kinds of things you know here we are looking at loons on the lake here on cross lake where we're at and then here we are on our our boat so one of the things that we launched last summer was an educational pontoon tour to bring people out and talk about loons talk about the science we're doing talk about the biology of loons their behavior i mean it was lots of fun and so we are a small team. We are a nonprofit of three folks here going to build more as we grow. And we, we have a lot of volunteers and a great board of directors that help us get everything done. We were founded in 2017 by the people of Cross Lake, uh, Minnesota. And they worked with the Minnesota design team to create this idea of the National Loon Center. And from there, it, it took off and formed as a foundation. And then we hired our first staff. So we're growing and we have lots in store for the future and our our mission is really to be protecting those breeding habitats where the loons are uh, promoting responsible recreation and serving as a national leader in loon and freshwater research and education so eventually we don't have our loon center yet it's in the process of being built so we Working towards this goal, here is a rendering of what a the new what the Loon Center might look like. A three-story state-of-the-art building where we would really like to bring people into the life of the Loon. And this is on track to open either the fall of 2024 or the spring of 2025, looking at some of those logistical aspects of what it looked like to construct the building and we'll hopefully have a better timeline uh, once we get towards the spring and summer months. We have a, a limited time here in Minnesota where weather is nice. To, to do some construction of, of a building. And this here is a very abstract rendering of what uh, an interior area could look like in the center. And so we would really like the center to immerse people into what it's like to be a loon with one of the key features being an ecosystem tower. So it brings you into what the life or what a loon would be experiencing underwater, on the surface of the water, in the air when they're flying or migrating. And so this is the abstract rendering of what an underwater um, area might look there's not exhibits in here, but as we're now have a design team contracted, we're starting to actually look at what those exhibits will look like. And so this is just a you know, maybe a kind of a visual concept of underwater, but there will be different learning points, different action items that people will take with them. And so the, the center will celebrate the life of the loon, but then also teach people what they can do to protect the loon and share the waters with the loon. Um, other aspects that could be inside a lab or kind of a classroom space where we can bring in samples from the water and do water testing. We can have school groups come. Uh, so there's different ideas of, of what we're going to have in there. And um, we've got some some great renderings here from Woodseth, the architecture team, on, on what that could look like. There are some things that are being uh, tangible that are tangible now, like some outdoor exhibits at the site. So we've put in one about loon calls, and then we're working on one on lead-free tackle, and then we'll work on other things like recreation, um, aquatic invasive species. So we'll have some things on site that people can already start interacting with. So right now we're out of a temporary center here in Cross Lake, Minnesota, which is in um, north central Minnesota, about two, actually in Cross Lake, we're probably closer to three hours north of Minneapolis. And we are here in this temporary spot called The Nest, a bit of a pun because it's where we're out of and growing from ourselves and so we're we're in this this visitor center this is where our offices are this is where we, people can come in and learn about what we're doing we also have educational exhibits in here um and we also have you know uh, some progress on our center itself and in this photo uh i promise we don't just randomly serve soup at the nest this was part of the Winterfest activities here at cross lake we just had this weekend and part of that's a soup fest so we we you know we take part in the events in the area too and to come in and, and also learn about the loons. 
And so here's an example, you know, of, of the displays that we have in here. This is a, a spot where they can already start to learn about loons, learn about their anatomy behavior um, and just about them, their behavior ecology in general. So they might be thinking, okay, why, why loons? Why have a national loon center? Why spend all this time towards them? And um, and I'm talking to a group of, of birders, so I probably don't have to convince you why to care about any type of bird, but loons are especially special up here in you know Minnesota. They're our state bird. There's a lot of pride in having them here and caring about the loon could also lead to caring about the greater ecosystem and because and, a lot of what leads to protecting loon also protects the the freshwater lakes where it it lives and breeds. And so this is a quote that I I liked from um, the senior biologist of the Loon Preservation Committee, and that's over in New Hampshire. There's um, northeast groups that are working on loons are the Adirondack Loon Center for Conservation in in New York, and the Biodiversity Research Institute in Maine, and then also the Vermont Eco Study Center, which is of course in Vermont. So I've got a few groups out in the northeast that are also doing some really great loon work. Make sure I'm on the right page here. We're going too far. And so loons aren't uh, necessarily in endangered or anything, right? But we we care about protecting them now because there are a lot of threats that they face that are unfortunately related to the things that we do um, in in this area, especially in, in Cross Lake, Minnesota. We're part of what we call the Brainerd Lakes area. And this is what's also considered the vacation land of, of Minnesota. A lot of people come up here to, they have their cabin for the summer. Um, it gets much quieter here now than it is going to be come uh, May after Memorial Day, we're gonna see a lot of people here. And so we, we know that we need to now make sure that we're spreading awareness and teaching people about how we can share these lakes with the loons so that they can stay here for, for years to come and how, you know, we can hopefully combat some of these threats that are already in place. And so there's there's a loss of habitat, there's disturbance from the activities of people, there's the spread of invasive species, there's threats to water quality that are all um, threatening loons. There's the you know changes in the weather that that are affecting them. And so they're they're facing a, a few more threats than they may have had in the past. And and one of those um, when you come into the nest here you you'll see one of those here in a specific exhibit about lead and UFTA still using lead. So UFTA is a Minnesota phrase that I also learned. It's uh, kind of just an exclamation of su surprise, I, I guess, or in, in could be used in different contexts, but this is kind of trying to say, hey, you're still using lead and just start that conversation. So we don't have any legislation in effect in Minnesota that, that really um, regulates the amount of or the use of lead in fishing tackle. There is some with hunting for, for waterfowl, but for fishing tackle, there isn't yet any. And we're, we're really trying to encourage encourage voluntary um, switch to lead-free tackle because lead poisoning from tackle is one of um, the leading causes of, of loon mortalities. And in the Northeast, they have a lot of data that this has affected. I think in New Hampshire, it's it's around 40% or so of loon mortalities were, were due to lead poisoning. And here in Minnesota, the estimate is around 20%. Um, and what we're doing at the loon center is we are doing necropsies when loons are, are found uh, you know, dead. We, we send them to the University of Minnesota Veterinary Diagnostic Labor Laboratory to do necropsy and they also test for lead. Um, and this just started in 2021 through, through us. So we have yet to accumulate a lot of data, but hopefully over the years, we will get some more to really get a sense of what's going on and if lead poisoning is also you know affecting the loons out here the same way it is in other places and so we work a lot with a group here called get the lead out minnesota which is a separate organization through the minnesota pollution control agency specifically about this issue and we we partner with them a lot we have a lot of their resources here we have lead free sample um sample packs, we have a drop-off box, we've collected seven pounds of lead in the past two years, which is, um, you know, really great to see we're already getting some some dropped off and we'll dispose of that responsibly. And we see a lot of, I would say a lot of positive uh, response to this, a lot of understand the issue, a lot of people are happy to get the lead-free 
um, sample packs, it's, I think a lot of the issue is a matter of availability and being able to find it and then it being affordable. And so the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has on their website a, a list to be able to find lead-free tackle. And this issue is, is important everywhere, you know, lead, um, if we're using it for fishing or for hunting can affect a lot of species. And so you don't have to be in Minnesota to, to look at this during those websites. Some of them are Minnesota-based, some are selling all lead-free tackle or, or other things, but you know, you can order things. So you can still come onto this website. Um, if you search, get the layout out Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, you'll find this website and you'll find the resources if you and you and you know are looking to find some lead-free tackle. So going on to uh, another threat that's facing the loons is, so the loons are up here in Minnesota and in the northern parts for their breeding season through you know, the very end of spring, through the summer, and then through the beginning of fall. And they're nesting on our lakes. And as I mentioned before, the, the threats are a, a loss to this nesting habitat to um to be able to have these these protected areas, these shorelines, you know, there's, as you can imagine, a lot of human development in the area, a lot of people building things and contributing to a loss of their natural nesting habitat. And so here in Minnesota, we, we have 12,000 breeding loons here. So the largest population in the lower 48 states, second to Alaska. And as you can imagine, this is probably largely due to the fact that we have 10,000 lakes, land of 10,000 lakes is actually over 11,000 lakes that we have. So we have the habitat to support a lot of common loons in this in this area. Um, but of, of these, these habitats where they prefer to nest, these small islands, protected bays, and marshy, grassy shoreline are in, in danger of, of development and um, in danger of, of disturbance from people and, and other factors. And so you'll you see a lot of people though are, you know, especially our lake associations in the area are really engaged and really wanting to protect the loons. And so we have, you know, our, our no wake zones established. Some people put out signs, put out buoys to try to protect the nesting habitats because the loons they're, they're um they can be pretty hidden in, in cattails or in these marshy areas. It can be hard to find the nest so people may accidentally come too close to a nest and that could push I'm gonna go back to this picture here you know they, they usually nest where they can easily slip into the water and so if they're um afraid of any threat there but they might come off the nest and go into the water which then leaves the eggs vulnerable you know they're not incubating as they as they should so with repeated disturbance that could affect the viability of the eggs um and so if if we're getting too close though with boats. If we don't have a no wake zone where there happen to be nesting and someone's um, not really ad adhering by by kind of the boating standards and, and creating too much of a wake near the shoreline that could flood out the nest as well. And then it's it's not just motor boats too, as you know, I'm a big kayaker and I'm used to always being by the shoreline, but now I know when I'm up here in Minnesota, I have to be really careful around the nesting season and around May through June, if I'm going to be paddling too close to, to shoreline, that looks like it could be loon nesting habitat because I don't want to accidentally scare a loon off its nest. So it's kind of being aware of, of where our loon be, where they could be nesting. And, and then once they're off that nest, you know, where they're bringing the chicks. So in, by the time they're, they're nesting, it's about early early May through through June, you know, kind of depending on the year. Last year we had a really late ice out. We didn't have ice out on our lakes until mid-May. So the loons got a bit of a starter or a later start to the to the year than than usual. Um but it, at that time you, you don't have a lot of people yet in this area. It really starts to pick up after Memorial Day, after the fishing opener in in May, and then more people start coming in. So they could be nesting on a shoreline that might be peaceful and and quiet but then once they you know once it's June or so and they have young chicks there might suddenly be a lot more people there might be boats in the area and so then that adds an, another threat and those those young chicks are definitely vulnerable um and we unfortunately do have some boat collisions that happen or any crossy studies we have seen 
several loons that had have had a cause of death be to blunt force trauma to the head, which we really you know wouldn't think that would be anything other than a boat or a jet ski collision that could cause that kind of trauma. So it's unfortunate that we are seeing that, but with the data from our necropsy studies, we're able to strengthen our messages of people for why we need to have loon safe boating to say, you know, we do see this happen. People may think that the loons will just dive away, but the young ones may not be able to. And we've even seen adults, we've seen some of those um, blunt force trauma deaths with adult loons too. So the adults don't always get out of the way in time either. And so, so working on these factors, working to protect the loons, we're working a lot with the Minnesota um, DNR, Minnesota Loon Restoration Project. So this project received money from um, the, the aftermath of the BP oil spill because there were loons that were affected by the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico where they're, where they're wintering. Estimated, I think about a thousand loons died. And so this, this money is now working to restore the population and restore nesting habitat. Um, and you see here their objectives are making sure we're protecting loon habitat, maybe implementing nesting platforms as needed and promoting stewardship through loon friendly lake registry programs, working on uh, management plans for the lakes and then monitoring the loons through a volunteer survey program. So we're working with this loon restoration project folks to, to assist in how we can with this project. And so, here where we have loons nesting, some people have have started using nesting platforms to help help the loons in cases where there might not be um, natural habitat. But you know we we would of course prefer to see that the the natural nesting habitat is protected or restored first. Um, and you know we always advise people here that we do use a platform to attract loons because our loons are very territorial. So we say about a, a lake the size of 13 to 100 acres can support a pair of loons. And so we don't want to put in a platform and attract more loons and, and create competition that wasn't there before, or, you know, have too many loons on the, the lake, then there there's fish to, to support them. And so uh, we, you know, we work to make sure we're, we're advising people if, if they come to us and say they want to put out nesting habitat, we, we go through these guidelines, you know, we make sure you know, are, is there any natural sites on your your lake? What are the, are the water levels like? Because even if you have natural nesting habitats, if they're getting flooded out consistently, that could help. Or predators, and you might be wondering which which predators. So some um, nests on the shoreline are susceptible to mammals, like raccoons could come and eat the eggs. So that's why they often prefer those small islands so that they're off off of uh, shore there where those those mammalian predators can get them. And so nesting platforms can sometimes help in those cases too. Uh, but you do want to make sure, you know, that it, it's a few years because loons can can vary from year to year in their productivity. Uh, and so going into just to our next, you know, topic that can, can affect loons is water quality. And so there's a lot of work in Minnesota that, uh, to monitor to monitor the clarity and and different aspects, you know, the contaminant of our, our lakes, because this does affect loons. And here, what we're doing aboard our our educational boat, the stewardship, we're taking a water clarity measurement with a Secchi disc. And the water clarity can definitely affect loons because they are visual predators. So in this photo, you see it's, it's doing behavior, what we call P-ring, and it's looking down to look for its prey, which is fish. They also eat other um, aquatic critters like uh, frogs, leeches, other types of things. And then their diet, of course, varies when they're um, on their wintering grounds and coastal waters. They'll eat other things too. Um, but they they really are needing to look and see to see what that, that um, you know, where, where their prey is. So if the water clarity or the transparency is reduced, that of course affects their ability to find their prey. And the water quality in, in general is also going to affect the availability of the prey. You know, so if we have reduced oxygen levels in the water, we might have less fish, and then we have less fish available for our loons, and they might have a harder time feeding their average of two chicks that they have. So it's kind of all um related here and this of of course is might not be just specific to our loons and we have the the, the loon there the whale that i hope you 
fit here, there, but our, our loons are breeding up um, in these northern states and, and a lot through Canada. And then there's just kind of our, our 14 lucky states that have loons that breed there. So here we are here in Minnesota and here you guys are in Ohio, here just south of the breeding range of the loons. But as, as you mentioned, you, you see them when they're staging on the Great Lakes. And so, you know, we, we, we may be really focused on the water quality of, of the, the lakes where they're breeding, but we, you know, we want to make sure we're, we're, we're protecting the loons year round too, right? So they're, they're migrating through all these areas or on the coastal waters. You know, we want to make sure the Great Lakes have healthy water to support the loons. We want to make sure our coastal waters are healthy. We want to make sure the, the lakes and the reservoirs areas where they might be stopping on their migration route um, is also, you know, all, all healthy. So it's, it's, it, you know, protecting the loons is, is a nationwide effort, you know, uh, it's, it's in multiple areas. It's part of their entire, entire uh, life, you know, cycle that, that we're focused. So even the, if you don't have loons breeding in Ohio, you know, you're, I say you're, you're, actions to protect the environment tech, everything are going to be helping them out. So let's look specifically at loon migration here. So this is a map of um, where loons in the Midwest, specifically Minnesota and Wisconsin, have migrated based off data from banded loons that were recovered on the coast on the wintering grounds or the USGS did a Midwest migration study a few or several years ago and did use um, the satellite tracking. So this is where this data is from and have key here to help us with what we're looking at. And so our endpoints are red here, that's Minnesota and a green is Wisconsin. So that's where they were banded or, or tagged. That's where they were, they were breeding. And then we have where they traveled to. So our light blue lines are wintering adults and you can see most of the loons from Minnesota and Wisconsin are going down to the Gulf of Mexico Actually, along Florida's Gulf Coast, and as I mentioned, you know it all all you know ties in year year round to to protecting the loons. As I as I also previously said, we had a lot of loons in the Gulf of Mexico that were affected by the oil spill. So things that is affecting the water on the coast and, and you know in these coastal waters is also affecting our loons. And so our dark blue is wintering first year loons. So loons that um, are about five or so months old maybe younger, it's um, the first time I think they know exactly where to go somehow. So it's very interesting. The adult loons leave lakes, the lakes first here, and then our juvenile loons stay a bit longer. So they sometimes stay as late as you know, right before the, the ice is on the lakes and they somehow know where to travel all these miles down on their own. And some of them you see end up going a little too far. Some of these dark blue lines are somehow overshooting the main wintering ground just a little overzealous, uh, but most of them are ending up here and our, our, the Minnesota and Wisconsin loons are breeding side by side. Then we have these orange and dark pink lines. And so loons don't um, always come back up right away after their first winter. They, they might not come back up and breed in their second year. So they sometimes will spend, well, they typically do spend a few years on the wintering grounds before they return back up to the breeding lakes. And when they do return back up to these northern breeding lakes, it can even take them a few years to settle on a territory. So it takes a while before we'll see um, a chick that was born in on a lake in, in Minnesota this past year in 2022. It'll be several years before we may see it again on the lakes back, back up there in Minnesota. And so some of those are traveling or migrating a bit north up here up the Atlantic and spending their time there instead of returning. So, you know, here we see Ohio here, you're right, on this migratory path. And you may also maybe seeing loons coming down from Canada that also stage on the Great Lakes and that do um, also travel down to these coastal wintering grounds. So you could be seeing loons from lots of different places. And this may be 
looking for a needle in a haystack, but you could, if you see those, those loons staging on, on Lake Erie, maybe try to see if you spot any bands on them. So we have about 150, I want to say, loons that have been banded through our, our research at the Loon Center since 2021 um, that, that have the USGS silver band, federal band, and then three different colored bands on them. So this is part of our research project and we are studying and monitoring them here uh, on their breeding grounds. Uh, but then uh, of course there's that whole time of the year where we don't know too much about what's going on when they're when they're on their wintering grounds. And we, we, it'd be of course amazing if someone were to, to see them and spot them and report that. But again, we have to remember we've got a, a small selection of loons compared to our, our 12,000 Minnesota loons, but maybe one day someone will spot one of the banded loons and put it to the federal bird reporting um, system. So our, our research started in 2021, um, specifically surveying in our um, county, mainly on our, our, our chain of lakes that's here and then surrounding smaller lakes. So we get a mix of, of lakes that do have a lot of people on them, recording a lot of boats, and then some that are smaller lakes, some that are private lakes as well. So we get that comparison with how the loons are doing in this area. And then compare our, you know, af after several years, once we have enough data to analyze some trends, we can start to compare, you know, how this might look to the overall volunteer survey, the Loon Watcher survey in Minnesota that, uh, where, where people report the number of loons they see and the number of chicks they see um, each summer to that, that larger survey. Um, but ours, um, to, to distinguish from that one, ours is focusing on specific areas, specific study population and focusing on, on banding those loons so that we can tell them apart and we can see if they are returning year from year in our area. Um, and so here is a look at what a banding night might look like. It happens at at night. We, we would switch our field day, not even day anymore, <laughs> switch to our field night from about 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. and go out to try to find the loons. So that is the, the easiest way to find them is at band them is at at night and you can use a spotlight technique to be able to to catch them otherwise during the day they're going to dive it's going to be very difficult and this is the only time we really put hands on the birds but it's very invaluable to be able to get that knowledge of if individuals are returning especially um when we we ban chicks we know exactly how old they are and then we know if our, our chicks that were born here if they're surviving over many years and then returning back to some or natal lake. Uh, and then of course you can take blood samples and feather samples, which also provides a lot of um, great data. You can test for contaminants and things like that. So we've got a, a combination of colors that we use and they all have different codes. Some of them are nice and bright, uh, easy to see. The orange and the yellows, those are my favorite and my least favorite is the mint and the iceberg. They look very similar, especially when you have a blue lake, but and it's sometimes hard to see them. For example, here, this picture, I, I, you know who this loon is. So I know that it's on the um, right leg there, it's silver over mint, but in the field, it might be hard to try to tell if that's mint or iceberg, but that's, you know, fortunately one of the things we have to work with to try to get a combination of colors. We have some that are a little more similar than others and it can be tricky. So in this picture on the left leg, that's actually copper over copper, but it kind of looks like two different colors just because of the lighting up a dough. Um, so it can be tricky to look at the bands, uh, but it, it's um, easy when you have them flying in this way because then you can see both legs, but usually we're trying to see one leg at a time, hoping that they'll turn around, hoping they'll stick a leg out of the water. So it's a bit of a le learning curve to be able to read the bands on the loons, but you, of course you read them um, closest to the leg. So this is silver over mint on the right leg and then copper copper on the left leg. So that's how we'd read their bands. So now uh, I, I kind of did this presentation a little bit differently how I do, do other ones. And I, I, I usually start with biology, maybe get a little, a little broader, but for this one, I kind of went broad and now I'm going down some more specifics about the biology of the loons. So the common loon is 
you know, as we as we kind of mentioned throughout this, it's it's breeding on those northern freshwater and wintering on the coastal ocean waters. It's weighing about seven to thirteen pounds. It's actually a pretty heavy bird, very strong. They have dense bones compared to birds that are mainly flying uh, so that they can dive. And so they have a very heavy weight compared to their wingspan. And so they actually need a runway to get off the water to be able to take flight. And they are found worldwide. There are loons that uh, breed in like Iceland and in other places of Europe. And then of course, a lot in Canada as we saw the map before, and then the, just those 14 lucky states in the US. And so, we're at April through August. August. This is how we are, are familiar with, with the loons. They are in their breeding plumage here with that black and white pattern, um, the black head, the, the red eye, and then that, that necklace that's actually kind of iridescent. So it can look green, bluish, purplish in the light. And then they have their young. So they typically have two, two chicks um, and they will stay with their family. You'll see them in pairs. You'll see them both aiming for the young, feeding them. Um, when they're really young, those first week or so, they they ride on the back of their parents to, to stay safe from you know predators under the water uh, and to help regulate their body temperature. And the, the chicks are very adorable at this stage. And they've got those downy feathers. It's one of those special things that you know, we all love to see up here is to see them um, on a very calm morning before before the day starts to see the loons with their chicks riding on their backs. And sometimes they'll have both of them on their back. You'll see one and then you see the other one tucked under the wing um, while the other air member might be out gathering fish or, or, or and then come back. Um, but typically at this, you know, from from April when they're returning, they they arrive soon after the ice is out on the lakes. They meet back up with their with their mate, they may find a new mate. They don't necessarily mate for life. Um, and they, if they can, they will return to a territory that they were successful at. They're pretty faithful to their territories, not so much e each other. Uh, so they can have a few mates per life, maybe you know, three or so, but they, you know, if I guess the ideal situation, they both make it back from migration, they find each other. They were successful the year before. They, they'll try again this year. They may try in the same territory. If another loon doesn't evict them off of theirs, eviction is common among the loons to be able to get a new territory. Um, but they can, they'll return and they'll, they'll nest for about 28 days. They'll incubate the eggs and then it's about 12 weeks until the young are at their fledgling stage. Around August through October, that's when we start to see what we call social gathering. So I mentioned before that the adults leave first. So once they're young, her at that fledgling stage, they're kind of saying, you know, I, I did my job, I did my three months, you're you're independent, you can be on, on your own. We start to see the juveniles be a lot more by a lot more dependent, more, more on their own, a lot farther away from the parents. And then you slowly start to see them be you know, completely independent of the of the the of their parents. They they might not be um the, the, the adults might not have left for migration yet, but they might be on a larger part of the lake um in those groups foraging, getting ready for migration. So kind of in that that early part of the summer, they're very territorial, they're in their family units. And then as we see at the end of the summer, they, they start to be more you know social, so to speak. They they're able to um, coexist in, in these groups and and um, get lots of lots of fish to prepare prepare for the long long travel and once once they're gearing up for migration they'll start molting and that usually starts around their their beak and their head so you see this here this loon is, is starting to molt and then towards the end of 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 the nesting season the adults We'll start transitioning to the wintering plumage. It's not a complete bolt, but this this partial molt gets them ready to get down um, down down south to some some warmer waters. Um, I I think they kind of look a little more raggedy, so to speak. They're losing that coloring. Their their eye gets dull, um, and this 
at this time of the year when they're up at the lakes and we still have adults that remained, we can, if we look closely, distinguish them from the juveniles. And so juvenile um, at the late fall looks much more sleek. Um, it's got scalloped feathering. So you see the white edges around its, its feathers and that's how we can tell them apart. So it can be tricky. There are some adults that stay later than others. And, you know, typically by the end of fall, it's, it's, it's safe to say there's probably mostly juveniles around, but, you know, we always say take a closer look with binoculars or spotting scope to really see um, if you're a wintering adult or adult in its wintering plumage, I mean, or a juvenile still, still on your leg. And then of course, when they're on their, their winter grounds, that they are in that wintering plumage, so undergo a complete molt. Um, and then they'll be back in their breeding plumage to come back up here for the spring and start the nesting season again. I do wanna highlight some interesting behaviors of the loons. Uh, so they do what we call a penguin, which I'm not sure exactly why it's called a penguin dance, is they'll, they'll rear up their head, kind of like a cobra, they'll splash their, um, their, their legs against the water, their, their wings will be outstretched. And that is a display that's showing that they're threatened or stressed. So they'll do it against other loons and they'll often do it at people if we get too close. Um, so we, you know, we tell people that a loon's going to let you know if you're getting too close to it. They'll also vocalize uh, a lot of, a lot of folks up here. So, you know, can't imagine what it's like without hearing the call of the loon on, on the lake and the whale that we heard, that's kind of that iconic species or not species, iconic call. Uh, that they do, that's a long range call, but a tremolo is more of a short range alarm call. Hopefully you can hear this here. So tremolo, that's um, a call that they, they use if, definitely if something's getting too close to them. Um, they also use it in flight and it sounds slightly different. So there's different contexts that it's used with, but um, typically, you know, just for, for the, the sake of ease, if we tell people if you're, if you're on the lake on your boat and you start hearing that, it could be a good chance that you might be too close. Could be towards other loons, other threats that they see, but just to be safe. Usually, we tell people, you know, if you're if you're hearing the loon vocalize and you're near it, and you don't see other any other source for what it could be, it could be a sign that it, that loon could be stressed, and you just need to back away a little bit. And then, um, a lot of people, you know, around here, we, we think of the loons and we think of it as being this full bird. You know, think of a calm, serene. Uh, morning on, on the lake, see the loons, but it's not always this serene setting. I mentioned that they're very territorial and that they can evict each other off um, a territory to, to gain you know, access to that nesting habitat. And those can be particularly aggressive, especially among males, as the males are the ones that choose the nesting location. So they have that stake, you know, that's um, that in that image of, of where the the, the, you know, the successful nesting locations are and, you know, having, having that, you know, stake in the nesting habitat makes them not want to, to give it up. The females can also be in, in these territorial battles, but if a male to male territory battle may be more likely to be fatal or cause injury. Here is a video of what this looks like. That loon there is doing wing rowing where they, instead of, there's some vocalizing this here. So we hear yodels, those are also territorial call given off only by the males. So it's maybe likely two males that are fighting, just given how aggressive it is. So there's a the wing rowing again. Um, wing rowing, they're using their, their wings to quickly escape across the surface of the water. As, as I mentioned before, to be able to take off the water, they have to have a runway. So sometimes they do just use those wings to sort of paddle themselves across a lot quicker. So it's, it's not always in a peaceful setting. There are those territorial battles that occur. Uh, let's see, it's not letting me move forward past my slide here. I'm just going to stop sharing for one second so that I can get to the next slide and start sharing again. Just by location. Okay. The YouTube videos usually get a little wonky when you present them. Okay, so I talked you through a uh, quick bit about the stewardship, about you know the stewardship of loons and, and lakes, about the 
behavior and biology. And I had mentioned in my my bio for this talk to, oh, to also be able to talk about the other species of loons, which uh, there's just so much to talk about that I don't think I'll get to be able to say too much about them, but I did want to include in some pictures of what they look like. So this is in order from the top uh, left here of the size of the loon. So the red-throated loon is the smallest species of loons, and we have the Pacific and the Arctic, and then the yellow-billed loon. And the yellow-billed loon looks very similar to a common loon, but just, of course, the yellow bill. So our common loons are the um, largest size of the loons, but it does vary across regions. So our loons in the Midwest are a bit smaller than the loons in the Northeast because the loons in the, in the Northeast and New Hampshire, Maine, when they migrate for their wintering grounds, it's just kind of going boop across the, the state there to the Northern coast, whereas loons coming from Minnesota or the Midwest are traveling a lot farther down south to the Gulf of Mexico, so they're a bit lighter. And then loons that are coming from like Central Canada are going to be probably way the less because they are traveling even further. And the Pacific and the Arctic loons look really similar. Um, the Arctic loon is also known as the black-throated loon. It can kind of get a greenish hue to its throat patch and the Pacific loon can kind of a purplish one. It's hard to tell. It doesn't really come off in these photos. And then of course you can tell them apart by size too, but which, you know, unless you see them side by side, it could be hard to tell. So it, they, those ones are a little tricky to tell apart. But I wanted to give a, a little more attention to the red-throated loon as I shared with me that you've also seen these um, passing through and, and I believe saw, saw them on your Christmas bird crown. So the red-throated loon is very neat. It, it is that, that smallest species of loon and it's breeding way up north here. You see its migration is here through the Great Lakes area. Some of them go down to the Atlantic coast, the northern Atlantic coast here, some down to the Pacific coast. Um, they're very neat in that they, you know, especially in Alaska, it's been re reported that those loons nesting on the um, you know, freshwater areas here, this one's taking off, will often go out to the coast, you know, to the ocean waters and or coastal waters and, and get fish and then come back. So they're a bit unique compared to the other species of loons in that they may actually, you know, leave the to forage and then come back. Um, in that video, which I'll play again, also dem kind of demonstrates how they can get off the water a little bit quicker than a common loon could since they are a lot lighter. They don't need as much of that runway. They're, it's a lot easier for them to take off from the surface of the water. Uh, and so I wanted to end with, with ways that you can get involved. And um, I heard that you did the bird count, so it sounds like you, you're already involved in, in know of eBird and I'll definitely report sightings of loons that you see to eBird. Those are really valuable to a lot of researchers to know where the movement of loons are. That's how we, we get that knowledge of them on the wintering grounds where we don't have people that are monitoring them like we are up here. We can have those reports to know their, their movement. And this project, specifically Journey North, which is based out of Wisconsin, may be um, something that could be a, a, applicable to your group. So Journey North is tracking uh, the migration of, of different species and, and the phenology of of, of the sign of, of spring migration area. So um, for loons, especially this their project is focused on reporting the ice out dates of lakes, and that's probably more um, applicable to, you know, as up here on, on the northern lakes, reporting the ice out lakes of of of, the, of these lakes that are the loons are breeding, um, but then also reporting first sighting of loons. So um, here is a map of 2022's first sightings coming from January through April. You can see they're tracking the movement of when the loons are first sighted and then they have their map of the ice out so they can correlate the ice out time versus the loons arrival, which is very neat. Um, so I don't know if you still see the loons now at this time of year, but it could be something that you could report to Journey North if once you see them coming back up, um, I, I believe you said you saw them on your Christmas bird count, so they may still be in the, that era. I, I, there are some loons that will um, winter inland versus going to the coast, so that could be a chance they could still be there. But if, if they've already passed through and, and they're coming back again, definitely um, 
keep an eye out and report your first sighting uh, to, to Journey North. That's a really cool project. And then first on our website, on the National Loon Center's website, you can learn more about the work we're doing, more about loons, uh, you know, more about our programs. And finally, just want to say thank you for having me. And if time for any questions, I'm happy to answer answer any questions you have. I haven't kept an eye on the chat, so there may be some there. Oh, thank you so much, Natasha. That was terrific. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, people have been talking the, among themselves. Uh, one person who's familiar with Minnesota says Cross Lake is closer to Duluth than it is to Minneapolis, St. Paul. So yeah, just, we are up to, north. Just to kind of get an idea as to where things are located. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. Well, you know, I'm I'm really pleased that you tossed in the Great Lakes area because I know when I communicated with you, I said yes. Our Christmas bird count had a fallout of common loons and the red-throated loons, so that was uh, kind of unusual for us. And mm -hmm. right now, Lake Erie is still wide open. It has not. Well, at least our basin, our part of the lake, has not frozen. So there are still possibilities of balloons just hanging there and eating up the, the fish that's uh, in, in our area. Um, oh, I, we got a couple of questions here. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you wanna um, take your screen down, maybe we can see everybody then. Um, sure, if I can stop sharing. And I asked the, the questions here, the first one, how long do they usually live? So uh, they're pretty long lived bird species you know among among birds they they live to about in their 20s and the oldest ones are uh very old for for loons especially they're a pair um they have an interesting story they caused a bit of loon drama on on the internet this past year um uh, they are a pair that was banded on a wildlife refuge in michigan and they were banded as adults so based off the estimated you know time when they start breeding they were 2022 at least like 36 and 35 years old, I want to say, and they had been a breeding pair together for the past 20 years and have been successful in returning. And then last, last year, the loon drama was that the banded female was seen with an unbanded male and the, the banded male was seen on a, you know by himself on a different lake, which when they're evicted, they oh, often wow. do go to a different lake to recover and they may find a new mate. They may, um, you know, just have to wait till the next year but so that was the little drama some some reporters are <laughs> had, had a little fun with it and were had titles like oldest loon divorcees that type of thing so <laughs> we'll see what happens next year if they you know they could reunite or she may say the new guy's great sticking with him so we'll see but they're very they're very interesting they have a typical day at the loon center like for me that's a good question in very in the summer we have a lot of presentations we have our you know our field work going on so I can go out for a loon survey in the morning really early you start right right away after the sun rises um we have our our educational pontoon that goes out three days a week we have the centers open to the public uh, we're, we're working all kinds of programs this time of year it in in theory it should be a lot slower but there's lots going on in preparation a lot of um, partnership work and pro programmatic work. So these days I'm working a lot on some of our online education or on, on forming new partnerships to, to you know, increase our education programs to and to expand on our research. So a lot of those, yeah, lots of lots of work. It's it's good to be busy, but lots lots going on and, and we're a small team, but we're doing doing lots of lots of exciting things. And then our other question here is also monitor loons reported on Christmas bird counts along the Gulf of Mexico. And so that is um, a great question. And, you know, as we expand our research, that would be really neat to be able to include, you know, ways to, to monitor the, the wintering loons. You know, the, the wintering loon research is, there's not as much known about them on the wintering grounds as there is on the, on the, the breeding grounds. And so being able to study more 
of of what loons are being, you know, where they're being reported, what what their behavior is like on on wintering areas is going to be more important. So I, I can see that expanding into the future. You know, we don't currently have a database for this these things now, but you know, as we expand, as we have new biologists coming in and, and things, we could um, look into that. We have started working with folks on an iNaturalist project, if you're familiar with the iNaturalist as well, on a way to start reporting um, featured. So this is a little more morbid, but we're working collaborative, collaboratively on on this, this data, because especially in the past year, there's been avian flu, there's been some you know health issues among different species of, of, of birds. And so we, we've started a um, project called Beached birds on a naturalist, and it's where people can report sightings of loon or other bird species, other seabirds mortalities. And so that just came up. And so that'll be kind of start of our progress into to learning more about them on the wintering grounds, is, is starting with getting those sightings of when loons are um reported um, um dead on the on on the wintering grounds. And so uh, you know it's you hope you don't go walk around on the beach or, or the shore of a lake and see one, but it is an important for, for us. You know, hopefully you'll take a picture and submit that to a naturalist. If you do come across one, um, a dead loon on the lake, so it would be really great to try to contact a wildlife rehab center or maybe a game order or somewhere to try to get it tested for necropsy because avian botulism is something that affects loons on the Great Lakes when they're staging there and it has been a cause of death. So that could be helpful also with with getting the biologist in your state to to monitor that situation. Okay, so are are eagles predator predators more eagles had fewer loons on your place in Minnesota? So the eagle loon uh, relationship is is interesting. They have been living side by side for a long time, and the loons have a good alert system. They do that well also in response to seeing an eagle fly overhead and that can alert their partner or their, you know, their mate and they can hide their chicks um, and they can signal to the eagle that they've seen it. And so it, it can happen, but I think not as much as we, we think it may or may affect it. Um, I was just listening to a talk by a biologist the other week, specifically on can loons and eagles coexist. And he reported that the data seemed that the you know, eagle predation didn't seem to have a significant impact on the loon population. Um, you know, it, it happens, but it's kind of just one of those natural um, occurrences. It doesn't seem to be affecting them more than it has in in the past. Uh, but the eagles would be predators of the young chicks even, and of the adults if they can. The eagles can't really carry them away because the loons are so heavy, but they could maybe um, get one and, and drag it off onto the shore. Um, and, and there's, you know, other raptors that could be predators of their eggs when they're nesting if the eggs are vulnerable. Uh, so do we have our plan on having loon cams online so people can watch them? And so uh, uh, one of our volunteers has a loon cam on their lake that we have broadcast before on our website. And unfortunately, last year, they, so this was a loon cam on a nesting platform and um Last year, they chose to nest in a different location. And so, you know, we respect where the loons choose, uh, but we didn't get to have the loon cam, cam last, last year. But, you know, maybe maybe we can um, explore some other sites or see what happens this year, see if they'll return. The Loon Preservation Committee in New Hampshire, they have a few different loon cams, so they already have a pretty good established um, uh, online source to view loon. So I'd also check them out and... Stay tuned with ours. We'll see if ours is up again. Are loons a source of food for humans? I believe so in the past. Historically, they may have been not. Currently, they are protected. So loons are protected under the Migratory Bird Species Act. So it is uh, you know, legal to, to touch them, touch their nests, their eggs in any any way without the permits. So you know, we have our permits to be able to work with them um, to, and even to collect the carcasses. We have the permit to do so. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that no one is trying to eat a loon these days. And I'll pass the word about the Beach Bird Project. Thank you. Thank you for passing the word there. Yeah, if we, okay. if any loons are beached or injured or land in a wet parking lot in our area, we have a fabulous wildlife rehab center not too far away that 
will, you know, hold the birds for a short amount of time, make sure they're healthy, feeding their, you know, if they got scraped up, whatever, and then, and then release them on Lake Erie. So, so yeah, that's great. That's the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. They have a, again, a really good wildlife rehab group. That's really great to know. I'll probably have to connect with them about our, our Nine Naturalist projects. They may have some historical data about um, reported loon mortalities or, or injuries. That's really good to know that they're, I'll they're bet, working I'll on I'll bet it. they do. And that would be interesting if they happen to come across any banded loons that uh, I think they know what to do because mm -hmm. normally, uh, you know, just the fish and wildlife bands would be reported. But if there's yeah. color bands on them, they may want to know uh, who's doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Great questions, everybody. Any others? Well, again, thank you everyone for being here this evening. Natasha, that was fabulous. Um, loons are a favorite of a lot of people and loved your videos and the sounds and it was great. Thank you so much. And we'll hopefully, uh, we'll pass along information to others that, um, you know, if you're heading up to Minnesota, stop by and yeah, definitely and do. See how things are going. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you started working with loons. Primates are lovely. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm glad of how it turned out for me, too. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. And uh, we'll see you hopefully at, on a field trip or next month's program. Bye bye.